Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the show tonight. Uh, I wanted to, in this video tonight, I wanted to, I found a, a really interesting article from Modern Survival Online uh, talking about survival tips that'll keep you alive. And I wanted to go over some of those. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting article. Uh, the article was titled uh, 164 Kiss Kick-Ass Survival Tips to Keep You Alive. I'm not going to go over all 164 of these. That would take forever. Uh, but I did pick out around 20 of them that I want to go over tonight uh, and just sort of discuss them. There are some good ones, some bad ones, uh, some that you know are a little bit more nuanced than they can put in an article. Uh, in their defense, I, I'm not going to be bashing on what they put in there. Uh, it's more of a, if, if they were to go into detail about these 164 topics, it would be more of a book than an article. So, uh, But I do want to discuss some of these. So I grabbed some that I thought were pretty interesting. Uh, some that, you know, will just bring up conversation. Some I agree with, some I don't. Some that really, you know, depends on the situation you're in. If you're talking full-scale SHTF or you're talking about something where you're just in a get-home situation or a bug-out situation but may not be that Mad Max-type situation we think about. Uh, so, all pretty interesting. So, like I said, I've got about 20 of these uh, in the chat. Hey, Miss Reading the River. Hey, Brandon. Uh, if you guys have any questions as we're going through with any of these or any ideas, uh, anything to add to these or even tips of your own, uh, I will try to uh, add those as well. Try to pay attention to the comments and put those up as we're going through this. But uh, uh, as usual, no guarantees. And I'll try to actually read it correctly too. Sometimes I mess that up. It's real tough, you know, by myself here trying to do that and this other stuff as well. Uh, Titan's in the chat. What's up, Titan? Uh, so at any rate, I suppose uh, what I will do. Uh, yeah, Brandon said in chat, we're all going to die. Yeah, unless you follow these survival tips, Brandon, uh, the, these these will save your life. Uh, I should have put in the title rather than these will save your life or that could keep you alive or, or will keep you alive. I should have put could keep you alive because some of them are uh, it just kind of common sense and some of them, uh, you know, it's just good things to do. But uh, at any rate, uh, what I want to do, I'll go through this. The I, I made slides of about 20 of them, so we'll just go through these. Uh, and then, you know, kind of expand on them. But this first one I've got here, it's number one on their list. And I don't have these one through 20 or anything. I just grabbed the number they have on their article. Uh, but I do have the link to the full article below. So, and there are some other ones on there that you might find interesting as well. But uh, leave some room in your bug out bag. And I think this is one that, that may be a little bit common sense. But honestly, a lot of us try to pack as much crap as we can into our bags. Uh, and that not only increases the weight, but you don't really have a lot of flexibility either. So uh, this says here, you never know when you're going to have to carry some extras, things you find along the way, or items your partner or kids ask you to carry, uh, extra stuff when you're forced to leave your vehicle behind. Uh, let's say you find an abandoned B.O.B. along the way that belonged to someone who died. Uh, you can basically take anything you need. Now, a couple of school thoughts on this that I have right away are one... I am going to be super apprehensive <laughs> in a situation, a dire situation like that, about something just laying on the ground. I am going to be, I mean, I'm already a conspiracy theorist, but I'm going to be uh, really, really worried about, hey, is this some sort of trap being set up for me? I'm going to be scouting around before I even touch the damn thing. Uh, so I don't know about all of that. You think about a bug out bag laying on the ground, that's one thing. If you're talking about full scale SHTF, there may be cars abandoned and stuff like that. I would be hesitant about that too, because if it isn't something uh, that is super bad, uh, you know, it, it, you may get yourself in trouble. So uh, along with that, the other thing that did comes to mind with this is that you should have, in, in a get-home situation, in a bug-out situation, you're talking about 24 hours to 72 hours, you should have everything you need. So stopping and ransacking through a bag uh, that you find on the side of the road or, or whatever you find, uh, you're probably not going to want to stop. You're probably going to want to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. Uh, so probably not a good idea. Unless you just have, you know, you, you just want... 
you know, you want to check out, maybe the situation isn't that bad and you want to check out and see what they've got because you want to uh, be able to take it home with you. So at any rate, I don't know. I mean, yes, I, I, I think it's a good idea to leave some extra room because like this, this says here in the very beginning uh, with uh, the, it, just the stuff in your car. Oops, got the wrong one here. Let me turn that off for a second. Uh, the stuff in your car. In a bug out situation, if you're at work, you're going to have stuff in your car. So if you have extra room in your bag, you may be able to load some of that stuff up or switch some things out, all that. So give yourself some flexibility uh, with all of this stuff. So next here, uh, Brandon said, let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, Brandon said, I hate pulling up Brandon's comments before I read them, but we're going to go ahead here. Uh, leave room in your BOB for other, another smaller BOB. You might need to. You have someone in your group that doesn't uh, have things foresight or have foresight to carry a BOB. You might need to scavenge extra stuff. Yeah, exactly. There are also, uh, we talked about on the podcast with uh, Brian and I a while back, they make these little, they're almost disposable backpacks that, that bunch up real small uh, that you could have one of those. I've got a couple in the car. Uh, just for that exact reason, if if you do have a coworker or somebody like that, uh, you know something, give them something they can carry rather than just a grocery sack or something like that. So, uh, Brand said, "Yeah, it is risky. It is. I know you, man." <laughs> All right. So the next one here, uh, number four on their list: keep your vehicle ready to move immediately. This is almost one that all of us, all of us preppers, kind of know. This it's one of those those big rules of prepping, right? A half a tank of gas is empty. Uh, with this, it says if your motor vehicle is part of your bug out plan, make sure it's well maintained and that the fuel tank is kept topped off as much as possible. Well maintained, I think, is the key part there as well. Uh, but topped off as much as possible. It's it's impossible to every time you go to the store, stop at the gas station, refill your car or your truck. Uh, that just not feasible, and that's, a, that's a, a waste of time and a waste of money as well. But if you always think of your, your vehicle as a half a tank is em- empty, uh, it is, uh, Miss Ringley River said, you stole my comment, yeah. If you think of a half a tank as empty, of if you think of a half a tank of gas as empty, then you are just going to fill that up. And along with that, you also want to make sure if you have some sort of bug out location or uh, your route to work, however far that is, you want to make sure you can get there with that half a tank uh, of gas as well. And that is not the the best case scenario of uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to take the highway. This is the fastest route home. This is all the gas I need. You're looking at worst case scenario. I've got to take back roads. There's going to be traffic jams. There's going to be things in the way. That worst case scenario of how much gas it would take to get there. So uh, at any rate, uh, it's very good information. Let me see which one we were on here. Uh, this one right here. Uh, also with this one, have the necessary emergency equipment to deal with the different weather conditions. Uh, have spare parts that com- commonly need replacing and the correct tools to install them. All, you know, really important stuff. Have the right tools in your car. I know people, uh, a couple people that actually have, just in case of an EMP, they have different parts that may be affected by that EMP that they keep uh, separate, not part of the system. That way, if something happens and they need to replace that, they can. Uh, You can even put that in EMP-proof containers, bags, and all sorts of stuff like that. But at the very least, uh, make sure you have... Uh, that stuff, yeah, screwdrivers, uh, extra hoses, you know, the things that the, the fluids and all that stuff, the things that you might need. Now, with that being said, if you have a well-maintained vehicle uh, and you, the, the odds that you're going to have to do something like that when you're when you're talking about one, uh, you know, going to a bug out location or getting home, the odds are pretty slim. But man, that would really suck if something did happen. Uh, and you had to, and you didn't have the stuff to take care of it right there. All right, so let's go to number, uh, the next one here. Uh, Number five on their list. Uh, Have a secondary bug out vehicle on hand. And as they say here, no, we're not talking about a second four by four, but something that you can put inside it, such as an inflatable boat, a canoe, a mountain bike, a foldable bike, or even a skateboard. Uh, Something you just never know when you're going to have to abandon your car. Uh, With this... I also think about, I, I think, I, I I was thinking about this and thinking, hey, man, it'd be cool to get it like a, four, a four-wheeler or a gator or something, put it in the back of my truck and just have it as my secondary bug-out vehicle. 
I don't know that Lisa would let me do that. But a mini bike, it would be a really good idea as far as if you have a truck and a place to store it because it's it's smaller. It's going to take up less room. It's a whole lot less expensive. I think they're five, six hundred bucks. Uh, who knows what they are now? Uh, but you could store a little bit of gas. They'll go a long way. In my situation, it would be pointless to have a canoe or a raft or anything like that. Maybe that works in your situation. Uh, that secondary type situ- a type bug out vehicle, a bike, one of the motorized bikes would be kind of cool, but that would be more of an urban thing out here. Uh, wouldn't do much good. But a mini bike could get me through a lot of situations. So that is something that that I'm thinking about, which would be very cool because say there's barbed wire fences around or something like that. Uh, I can actually, with the help of Lisa, maybe, I'm not sure how much they weigh, but you can get it over that fence uh, fairly easily. Of course, with a gator, you just run right through it. But, um, but you know, that secondary bug out vehicle, I think that is a, a very good, very good idea because even if it's just your feet, because you never know when something's going to happen along the way that you're not going to be able to use your vehicle. Uh, if you, you know, you cross your fingers that you, you can because that's your, uh, your best bet, but you just never know. Uh, the next one here, number six on their list, what to take when you're forced to abandon your car. Uh, this one, I, th- I'll have to guess at what they were talking about with this. And I just copied and pasted right from their website. So, uh, in this case, you may want to take some of the things from your truck with you as you continue your journey on foot or in your secondary bug out vehicle. Uh, so you're, you're going to have limitations in your car. You've got all sorts of stuff that you can bring. You've got the trunk or you've got the bed of your truck. Me, I've got an extended cab. So I've got things in there, uh, a room in there that I could do some things. But if it was that mini bike, it would basically be a bug out bag. I don't know if they make saddle bags for mini bikes or not. Uh, I think in a situation where there was two people on it, I don't know that there'd be room for saddle bags anyway. Uh, probably a little, uh, cart, tray thing on the back but uh but with two people you're talking about two bug out bags and so you're just gonna have to make make do with what you have in that situation all right so uh the next one i've got here number seven on their list is keep your hiking boots attached to your bug out via or to your bug out bag not your bug out vehicle uh i i said that is kind of a slip but i do have mine in my truck which is Better than just sitting by the back door, but uh, the ones that I use that I'm going to use uh, for a bug out situation. But it's not the same as having them on your bag. I don't have mine on my bag, but as they say here, uh, this way, if you get to your it, this way, if you have to get to your bag and leave in a hurry, you also get the boots without having, without having to occupy one of your hands. The other thing I think about with this is if you're in a rushed situation, if you're freaking out about something going on, maybe you're at work. Uh, and you're, you, you're just trying to get out of there as quickly as possible. Uh, if you're at work, one, you may not even have them there, but you may forget it. And then, you know, as you, you're a mile or two down the road, you're thinking, oh, crap, uh, I don't have my boots. And if you have to hoof it and, and you're in your penny loafers, uh, that's going to be painful real quick. Tennis shoes, maybe not so bad, but they're not as durable uh, as far as that long-term stuff. So especially if you're thinking about a bug out situation where you're talking three days, get home situation, tennis shoes may not be that bad. Uh, they're not waterproof. Normally they're not waterproof. They're not going to be as durable. They're not going to be as warm. Uh, but having those, uh, those boots on your, on your bug out bag would just be something that you, you wouldn't forget it. With me getting older, uh, it is one of those things that my, <laughs> I would probably forget it. Uh, so, all right, uh, the next one on this one, this slide right here, number eight, in case of social unrest, you may want to move to your bug, bug out location late at night or the early hours of the morning. This is the one, uh, Miss Reason River said penny loafers. You, you got to know what penny loafers are, or, or maybe I'm dating myself. I think that was even before my time. Uh, at any rate, uh, number eight, uh, move at night. I don't. I put this on the list because I don't necessarily agree with this. It says right here, uh, that's when most of the rioters as well as the police will be sleeping, so you reduce the risk of being bothered while attempting to leave the city. I don't agree with that at all. I think it's, you know, the freaks come out at night. Uh, the rioters, the looters, all of those people love the cover of darkness. So uh, the daytime, yes, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on, sure. 
Uh, but the nighttime, that's when the, you know, I think the, the criminal element really wakes up and starts going to work. And I don't think the police in a, you know, a, when you're talking about some sort of disaster situation, I don't think there, you know, there's going to be much sleep and grew up or going on. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I get the point of this where at night you've got the cover of darkness. You can kind of sneak out easily or, or maybe easier. But at the same time, uh, the the threats I, I think at that time of in you know at twelve o'clock at night two o'clock in the morning whenever those threats are going to be more more severe threats I think so. All right, so the next one here. Let's see. Let me check out the comments and all that stuff before we move on. Um, actually, making some pretty good time. I thought this was going to take me forever, uh, but uh, the next one here. If you're caught in a riot, this is 13 and 14 on their list. And uh, this says here, to get out of a riot, walk in the same direction as the protesters in the same speed, but at a slight angle uh, and adjust your angle depending on the side of the road that, that you want to get to. So if there are, you know, if you're trying to, if there are alleyways or something like that, uh, or it just you see, you know, sort of a, a free area where it's not this mob type stuff going on, uh, just kind of walk with the crowd uh, and just get out as, as quickly as possible, but not, you know, rushing and pushing people and doing stuff like that. Uh, it also says if you can get out of the middle of the riot uh, with nowhere to go, or if you get caught in the middle of a riot with nowhere to go, take shelter in any building whose doors are open. This is kind of the same thing as alleys. This is still a, you know, it's a, a better than nothing type thing, I think. Because in the middle of a riot, you just got people just acting crazy and doing stupid crap, and they're going to trample over you and not give it a second thought. If you go into an alley or something like that, and you just sort of wait it out, or you go into a building and wait it out, you never know what kind of people are going to be there as well. So I would be awfully hesitant about that. But maybe you get to that alley, and you can get to a different, you know, maybe that is your exit. You're, you're able to get away from that whole situation going on. This, I, I hate groups of people. I, I really just get really wound up when, you know, at, at football games or downtown or any sorts of events because the more people you get together, the dumber they seem to get. And it just really, really makes me nervous. And I think it's probably that OPSEC thing and that situational awareness where you're trying to pay attention to a lot of stuff. And the more people and the more stuff that's going on, uh, just it's it's like overwhelms my senses and it just makes me gives me high anxiety and uh, I just do not I just do not like downtown downtown drives me crazy but at any rate uh, so th the other thing is don't try not to get caught in riot don't be downtown uh, but I know that some people uh, actually work downtown or work in the suburbs work by schools colleges and stuff like that where things might happen. Uh, so, I mean, you just never know, but again, that's the planning aspect of what are my, what are the odds of me actually getting stuck in some sort of protest or turning a corner and all of a sudden all this stuff is going on. What are the odds of that happening? Me out here slim. Uh, so it's not something I really think about, but if I did live in some sort of college town, that would be pretty high on my radar. Or if I did have to travel into downtown or, uh, someplace that was really busy, uh, a tech center or something like that, it would be something I would think about. Uh, so at any rate, let's move on to the next one here. And this one is about bunkers. Uh, bunkers number 26. Sorry, I was trying to read the comments there. Uh, <laughs> uh, number 26 here. Bunkers are in most cases less than ideal. Uh, I think this is something we all know, uh, but I put it on here anyway because I thought it, it's interesting to talk about. Uh, the people outside can either wait you out or they can smoke you out if they discover where the ventilation system is. I think this is one I, I think about anytime we watch Doomsday Preppers. And we're always, I've watched a few of them where they have the, the people have their bunkers. And I'm thinking about, okay, uh, where is the ventilation system? Where is the entrance to that thing? Where, where are all these things? Because it wouldn't be that hard uh, if you were one of the bad guys uh, to get somebody out of a bunker. You're, you're basically stuck in a cage. Uh, but at the same time, bunkers are, are pretty, you know, I don't know how many of us actually have a bunker in the first place. 
but it is something that is a really, um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to read, <laughs> read the comments again, but it is something that, um, that we all, we talk about all the time or, or people assume that every prepper has got a bunker. And I don't know that many of us actually do. We have plans. If say like here in my basement, uh, we have plans to do things, but I don't have a full fledged, uh, bunker going on. And I don't think a lot of preppers do, but I, I, that's also one thing that I always think about with that is if you're down there in a bunker, say there's some sort of nuclear attack or something, you're not sure when to go up or when it's safe to go up, but other people are already rummaging around. They go out and find you, or maybe they just don't give a damn, or maybe they've got really good gas masks or something. I don't know. They can get you out. Regardless of how locked up you are, uh, they can get you out, and you've got to be ready to defend yourself if possible. So there are uh, a lot of catches with bunkers. So, All right. Uh, let me see. What is the next one here? We've got bunkers. Oh, the next one on here kind of, and in this article, they go through like bug out, bug out stuff, get home stuff, uh, cooking stuff, security, uh, communications, all that. So they've got it kind of more organized than I do here, but, uh, I just went in order the ones I grabbed. Number 33 on their list is cook from scratch. As a general rule, it's always better to stockpile the ingredients to make something instead of the food itself. And I I, I, I agree with this and I don't all at the same time because I think it's important to have all sort of... Uh, <laughs> uh, watching Dale yeah, talk and read comments is like watching golf announcer follow the hockey game. It's exactly what it's like, Brandon. <laughs> Uh, but uh, see, now I forgot where the hell I was. Oh, I, a well-rounded food preparedness plan, I think is a good idea to have. So have those ingredients. You can store more. You can save money on that stuff. If you just have the different ingredients, August and farms make some stuff. Uh, you can have the five gallon buckets that have different ingredients in it. Uh, we sell legacy foods at the SHTF shop and those legacy meals are actual meals. You just add water, uh, and cook those up. But in an SHTF situation, uh, you're gonna you're gonna be able to have you're you're gonna have more options, I suppose, if you have ingredients stored. You're gonna be able to make bread as long as you have yeast, or uh, you know, Augustine Farms has the powdered milk, the powdered eggs, the powdered everything. Uh, so having the ingredients is a, a good idea as well. Um, but at the same time, uh, and I think I've got a slide later on, store what your family's going to eat as well. So that's that's important. Uh, make sure you have that stuff that is going to you know keep you comfortable, keep your family comfortable. Uh, in an already stressful time, you don't want them uh, even more stressed out. So, all right, so, uh, so cook from scratch. This is the one I was just on. So we'll move to the next one here. Uh, and this is number 40 on their list. Use freeze-dried foods freeze-dried foods for your bug out bag. Uh, it says here, sure, you can still add energy bars and hard candy, but freeze-dried storage tastes great. They're lightweight and they'll provide you with not only carbohydrates, but all the essential micro and macro nutrients. Uh, they're, they also have an excellent shelf life. A couple things that I think with this is a good idea, especially like the uh, the dried fruits and all of that stuff. But if you're talking about mountain house meals, if you're talking about those things that need water, you're going to have to have a camp stove with you. You're going to have to, uh, you know, have either a water source or enough water to actually cook that stuff. If you have like survival rations, like in mine, I have some SOS bars. Uh, if you have those with you, those don't take any any water. Uh, they say they're not thirst provoking, but they they are. I've I've tried them before, and they do make you thirsty. But things like that 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 won't that have a really long shelf life, but won't require water or heated water. Mountain House is fantastic if you've got a mess kit and you've got uh, that a little camp stove or something, and you've got a way to cook that. That's great. But I think in a bug out situation, I'm more likely to uh, just want to grab something and eat it while I'm going. I don't want to have to stop and cook something. I just want to keep going, get from point A, to point A to point B as fast as possible. So uh, with that, yeah, freeze dried foods. But again, they are really lightweight. The, the, <laughs> I got to stop paying attention to the comments. 
Uh, they are lightweight, and uh, but at the same time, you got to be able to weigh to heat those if if it's necessary. Uh, along with what I was saying earlier too, keep in mind your family's allergies before building your food stockpile. And this is that store what you eat, eat what you store situation. You're going to want to make sure that what you have there, you're not going to have to fight with them getting, getting them to eat something, especially if you have children as adults, you know, it's, Hey, you know what? Don't eat, you know, I guess, uh, you know, don't eat. You'll get hungry eventually. Same thing with teenagers. But you want to have that, you especially want to be uh, cognizant of the allergies and stuff like that. So peanuts, peanut butter is fantastic for prepping. It's got a long shelf life. It's got uh, just a lot of calories, a lot of protein and all that. But uh, you want to make sure that you can actually, that stuff is going to be able to, to get used. Same with all the vegetables and all that stuff. If it's not going to get used, it's sort of a waste of money. Uh, it's kind of going to sit there until it expires. And then you're just going to have to throw it away. So... All right, now this is one that I don't, you know, I agree with and I don't agree with. Uh, number 48, unconventional hiding spaces, uh, places. Places to hide your food and water include a fake air vents inside trash cans, inside Pringle cans, in fake pipes, in PVC pipes buried underground, uh, inside trees, barns, wells, in abandoned cars, inside pots and pans, uh, things you don't use in your garage. I don't know that I would necessarily say food and water for all this. All of those would be really cool, uh, you know, hiding spots for for some things. But I don't know necessarily that it would be a food and water uh, type thing because you're, you're talking about a lot of space when it comes to food. Now, outside in PVC pipes, uh, maybe a little bit, you know, some canned foods, something like that. When you're talking about water, uh, you're talking about a lot of water to be uh, it, you know, hiding away in small little air vents and stuff like that, or a Pringles can. I, I, why would you hide food in a Pringles can? I don't quite understand that. But a lot of the other stuff, and maybe this is what they were alluding to, there are a lot of other things that you could hide in those places that would be unconventional, that people wouldn't think about. Uh, hiding cash in different places, maybe ammo uh, inside fake heater vents, important papers, all those those different things that you could uh, put in there that uh, people wouldn't really, if they were just ransacking your place, uh, they wouldn't necessarily think of those. Uh, and you would still have some. And maybe you could. Maybe inside a little heater vent, you get five or six cans of Spam or something. Throw those in there. That way, if somebody comes and ransacks you and takes everything you have, uh, you have that stuff, uh, you know, hidden away. We have, and it's not necessarily a, a unconventional hiding spot, but under our bed, I built a couple sliders. And I've got a video on here and an article over at Survival's Prepper. Uh, which is just an under-the-bed slider, which on both sides of the bed, uh, it goes halfway in under the bed, and you can pull it out from each side. And in that slider, you just pull it out. I've got, you know, on Lisa's side of the bed, i got a big giant knife. On my side of the bed, I've got some other stuff and some canned food and stuff like that as well. So there are some things you can do. It's not necessarily all just in the cupboards in your pantry. Uh, oh, <laughs> Miss Reading the River said, opens a Pringle can. Pours out soup, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what the shelf life is in in with soup in a Pringles can, uh, but uh, I'm I'm thinking you know <laughs> not gonna last all that long. So, uh, all right. So the next one on this right here, we've got. Don't forget to stockpile things that will help you open, cook, and consume the stuff that you have stored. And this is really important. We talk about P38 can openers all the time, making sure you have a manual can opener. Back 30, 40, 50 years ago, this wasn't such a big deal. But these days with everything being electric, uh, the electric can opener sitting on your countertop, the, you know, you've got electric knives and all sorts of stuff these days. So make sure that you have the stuff um, it, that uh, will actually get those things open. Now, granted, as preppers, we learn about different ways to open cans if you don't have a can opener, uh, but it's important to have that stuff. Something that I would add to this as well, possibly, and it's really up to you, but paper plates, plastic utensils, stuff like that, that you're not going to have to use water in an SHTF situation to clean. Uh, you can, it's going to, it's going to produce more trash, but you're not going to be wasting water. And maybe if you've got enough gray water, it really doesn't matter. Uh, although I don't know 
uh, with soap and everything. It depends on how grave the water is, really. Uh, but uh, but I, I think there are, uh, you know, I, there's there's just a lot of things that need to be thought about rather than just the food, uh, because you need to be able to heat that food. You need to be able to open that can of beans and all that stuff. So. All right, so next on the list here, we've got uh, 60 here. Uh, oh, Brandon's going to be commenting on this one. Uh, bigger isn't always better. And I know there's there's probably a she said that joke in there somewhere. I'm not even going to go there. Uh, although, <laughs> maybe it's a she didn't say that. She never said that joke. Uh, at any rate, uh, number, 60, number 60 here. A bigger dog isn't necessarily better from a survival standpoint. Uh, because they need a lot of food and water. Uh, consider other options su- such as a Jack Russell Terrier, Basset Hound, or Beagle. I think this is one that, and I, I think a lot of us kind of fall into this, is because I've got my big dog. I love my big dog. But I've also got my little yapper, uh, little ankle biter dog. And I think in a some sort of SHTF situation where somebody's trying to get to your house or maybe a group of people, a large dog, if somebody's got a gun, I'm uh, not going to do, you know, a whole lot of good, you know, maybe a little bit, but it's not going to do much more good than a, a yapper would. I think it's that early, early warning that you would get from dogs just raising hell. I mean, that's the, the, the it, as much as it drives me nuts that my dogs bark at literally everything, it is nice, especially like the middle of the night, to know that if something is happening, I'm going to get alerted. All, it, it, I mean, it never, it's, it's always these days, luckily anyway, it's always, you know, that false alarm, shut your mouth, dog. But, you know, it is nice if you were in a situation like that, you would want that, that barking dog, I think, to alert you that somebody uh, is on coming to your property or coming onto your property. Uh, along with this, they had uh, a lot of different ideas as far as home improvement. And we've, we've, I've done a couple videos. I've got home improvement, home defense. Uh, I've got a couple videos here on uh, home defense stuff. There's a lot of things you can do. The door armor, uh, securing your door, even just using three-inch screws on your door hinges and stuff like that. There is, you can replace your glass with uh with the laminate uh, and stuff like that, you can put the window film on the that will make your windows where they won't just completely shatter. Uh, a lot of things that they have in this article. There's a lot of things you can do that regardless if the poop hits the fan or not, that your house is going to be better protected that we probably should do. Uh, and it doesn't need to all be done at once, but all of these, these steps uh, should be taken. Uh, but with this, on this, he talks about, or, or they talk about exterior motion activated lights. These are excellent for early warning systems for home defense. They alert you about possible intruders uh, and have the potential to intimidate villain, villains passing by. Uh, and I think this is one of those, I, I, the, the solar option for these I think is a lot better because when you're looking, you're thinking about an SHTF type situation, you are talking about a situation where you want to conserve as much of the energy you have. Now, it, granted, that depends on what type of solar setup you have. Uh, Jayhawk's in the chat. What's up, Jayhawk? Uh, Hill Country Prepper, how you doing? Uh, but it really depends on how much energy you have. But there are a lot of options these days as far as uh, solar power. You can get a really small solar panel that will charge a, a gate for your driveway. Or Lisa's got her riding arena outside for her horses. She's got uh, like six or eight lights out there that are all have their individual solar panel. So there's a lot of things you can do. And by the way, those when, when it all goes down, those will not be in her riding arena. Those will be strategically pl- placed around the property. <laughs> as motion detectors, really bright too. But it is a good idea. Even if it's not somebody trying to attack your stuff, uh, it is that situation where it may deter them. You know, anything you can do, the barking dog, and that's where a big dog would be uh, a, a, an asset because that big dog in your yard is going to make somebody think twice about jumping the fence or, you know, going in there. Motion lights, whenever they pass by and those lights come on, maybe they're, you know, Looking at the next house down, I'll put it that way. Uh, maybe they're checking that out rather than you. Now, if somebody wants to get in, somebody wants to get what you have, uh, they're going to get it uh, regardless, especially if it's a group of people that know that you have food, water, light, all of that stuff. I don't think I have any of the slides in here from their 
their tips about that. But that's another thing too, that being incognito in a situation where nobody around you has light, electricity, heat, anything like that. You don't want to be that person that does <laughs> because you've just made yourself a target. So covering the windows, making sure that, you know, the lights aren't on uh, in the middle of the night and making sure you don't have smoke coming out of your chimney and things like that. It's, it's that gray man aspect of the whole situation. Uh, so, Anyway, let's move on to the next. I've only got a few left here. Let's see how far. Uh, we're at about 35 minutes. Uh, it's telling me in the chat that I've got uh, I've got to approve uh, a bunch of, of comments from uh, from Miss Raven River. I'm just going to do it without reading. I hope I'm not putting anything on there that <laughs> shouldn't be on there. Uh, at any rate, let's go ahead with the next one here. Uh, and this is one that it, this is easier said than done. This is one that I, I think is a good idea, but I think it's near impossible. Uh, 67 and 69 are in their list are avoid providing potential burglars tools, uh, which can be used against you, such as a ladder near your residence to get up into windows, picks at pick access, spade ropes lying around, uh, eliminate objects from the ground from around the exterior of the house that can be used to toss through windows like decorative rocks, spare bricks, and so on. I think that is a really, I, I think that's damn near impossible. I think about my front yard. I've got firewood stacked up. I've got, you know, you, if you've got garden boxes with the railroad ties, something like that can get thrown through your, your window. If you've got trees, you can bust a branch off and it can get thrown through your window. So while I do agree with that, it's it's sort of that that mitigation type thing. Um, hey, White Rabbit, how you doing tonight? Uh, it's that mitigation thing. Don't don't give them too much ammo uh, to be able to bust through your window and stuff. I think it's the the other things, those early warning, the perimeter defense, the early warning stuff that you can do that you can do. I think is more important than that. Uh, to keep them back to where they're not in a position to be busting through your window. Uh, I don't have it on, I didn't get the uh, the one that they had in there about putting a peephole in your door at, at, at eye level when you're kneeling. <laughs> and I just don't know if that's a good idea or not. I, I, I think it's a bad idea because one, people come to your house, they're going to be asking you what the hell that is and you're going to have to explain it. But it, it's just that kind of an eyesore type thing. But I do like the idea of having some way to, maybe it's not on the front door, maybe it's somewhere else, where you actually have that vantage point. You can see what exactly is going on in your yard. That could be cameras, but also a, a way where it's, it, where it's you know, if the cameras go down, you still have some sort of option to do that. So, uh, at any rate, I mean, easier, like I said, easier said than done with this because, you, you can eliminate some stuff, but you just can't. If somebody wants to bust your window, they're going to bust your window, even if they got to go to the neighbor's yard and get something out of their yard um, and then come back to your house to get get into your house. So. Brandon said in the chat, give him ammo. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, the next one I have here, uh, consider your workplace as a bug out. Uh, sorry, I had to cough there. Uh, this needs to be careful consideration. Uh, if you're working downtown, that's probably the worst place to bug in. But if your office is more suitable in a more suitable location for bugging in, not it, it says it on there. Uh, if it, your office is a more suitable location for bugging in, you might want to discreetly stockpile some stuff on your desk just in case, in your desk or around just in case if you work in a warehouse, there may, there may be other places or options rather than just your desk. Uh, I know people, uh, some people that work in office buildings, maybe you work in a cubicle and you just have to have a few things in your desk. Um, but it would be, I think in a, you know, if you do work in the city, that would be a pretty bad place to be uh, because everything would just, that's probably where a lot of stuff are, is going to be kicking off. And you would want to, if at all possible, get the hell out of there. But there could be other places that it may be, you know, I I think of natural disasters and stuff like that. We've had that, that uh, we've had some massive snowstorms here where it started uh, late enough in the day where Lisa had actually gone to work. And then this has happened twice. 
uh, and then she wasn't able to get home because it was just safer to uh, stay where she was. Now, she stayed at a hotel across the street from where she worked, not necessarily where she worked, because I don't think uh, the doctor's office would actually <laughs> let her stay there. They're like, you, you can't go home, but you can't stay here, that type of thing. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Uh, but there may be situations where that may be the best possible place for you to just kind of wait things out. Uh, so uh, have, if you, if at all possible, have some of that stuff there uh, for you. Also, it's a good idea when thinking about that, like while you're, you know, with at, with stuff at work, you can have stuff in your car. But what if you're not able to get to your car or, or something happens where you have to go on foot? If you have some of that stuff in your 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 work uh, where you work, uh, you'll have you'll at least have something. So, uh, Miss Reading the River here in the chat said, "My workplace is the last place I'd want to go." Uh, uh, and then, uh, guy, can you imagine if coworkers showed up? Yeah, that that is true too. Because you can have there's only so much you can store. Uh, depending on where you work and all that, say if you work in an office building, there's only, there's only so much you can store. So all of a sudden, you know, you're sharing your saltine crackers or whatever you you have uh, with everybody in the office building. So maybe at some point you just want to get the hell out of there and try your luck outside in the riot, you know. And now that you got the the whole riot tips and all that, maybe maybe you just take off. Uh, so uh, at any rate, oh, I forgot on this one here. I think. Um, uh, number 112 here on this is have some means to overcome obstacles when you're bugging out. I forgot about this one, but this is uh, really important. This goes along with the, having the tools to fix your car if it breaks down. If you are in a bug out situation, there's a likelihood that maybe there's fallen trees uh, blocking your way, or if it's some sort of natural disaster, uh, you're going to have to maybe move that stuff out of the way. So make sure you have uh, tie downs. It would be a good idea, even in a car, even if you don't you don't plan on using them. Tie downs, ropes, uh, some sort of axe. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the big Paul Bunyan ones, but maybe something smaller than that, mid sized axe. Uh, shovels, those foldable shovel shovels uh, are really good. Not, you know, not the greatest thing because anything with a lot of moving parts like that is bound to break down. I've actually got one that I'm going to do a review on. I got a while back, uh, but, uh, but have stuff like that in your car, because if you do have to move stuff out of your way or, you know, get around different things, maybe you get stuck in the mud or snow, have stuff like that in there as well. Um, so that was that one. And then the last one I've got, well, I've got two more here. Uh, but this one, uh, number 116 on the list is don't make a fashion statement. Camouflage, urban clam camo, and black hoodies are all no-nos. Uh, you don't want to be mistaken for a prepper. Jeans and a t-shirt will do. Now, this one is kind of, it really, it, it's being the gray man, and I agree with it, but it really depends on your situation. Out here, I don't think anybody would give me a second look if I was wearing camel, unless they knew me, and, and then they'd be like, why the hell are you wearing camel? Because I never wear camel. But out here, it wouldn't be that big a deal. In downtown, if you look like you you just walked off the set at Duck Dynasty, uh, you know, you, you probably, you're probably going to get a lot of looks. So adapt to your environment. You want to be be the gray man, which basically means be as unremarkable as you possibly can. People will not give you a second look uh, if, you know, if you don't, if it doesn't, if you're not a threat to them or you don't have something that they feel like that you have to offer them. Uh, so it really depends on your environment, your situation, uh, and, and what is sort of, you know, going to help you fly under the radar with all of that stuff. Uh, that's the same reason, you know, the bug out bag, the reason I chose, chose the amp 72, it's not a full out tactical looking bug out bag. Uh, but you know, for anybody that is, you know, into hiking or into prepping and all that probably know that it is, but for the average person, it doesn't scream military, uh, like most of them do. So, uh, but, uh, 
with that, yeah, don't make a fashion statement. And that is that is not just an SHTF event. That is not just a natural disaster or something like that. That is everything you do on a daily basis to kind of fly under the radar. Uh, OPSEC is super important when it comes to preparedness because one, you don't want everybody to know. And, you know, coming from me sitting here on YouTube, yeah, I get that, but uh, and doing podcasts and all that. But for the average person, you don't want every, and you know, how many people, I, I don't know. But for the average person, uh, you don't want the whole world knowing exactly what you're doing because then you're going to have the whole world at your front door when things get bad. So, uh, or you don't want to, you know, be that target if you're downtown. Say you're downtown and you got your bug out bag and you got your camo on and all that. And somebody, you you pass by some sort of criminal that actually knows what the heck. Hey, that's some prepper dude. So that means in his, he's got six, seven hundred dollars worth of stuff in that bag right there. I'm gonna go get it. So. Um, at any rate, yeah, just try to blend in, be the gray man with everything you do as far as preparedness is concerned and, you know, kind of life in general. That's, that's kind of the way I've lived through life is just, you know, don't create a lot of problems, you know, face the problems when they arise, but don't, you know, don't put stuff on my plate unnecessarily. So, uh, number 141 here, uh, to practice it, I don't know why I put two in there, but it should be practice carrying your bug out bag. This is something I'm probably going to do that I haven't done, but I'm probably going to do. Uh, ditch going to the supermarket with your car. Instead, get a backpack and then load your groceries inside that pack and walk with it back home on your back. Uh, that way you'll improve your stamina, but you also save money on gas. And these days, it may not just be a choice uh, to, <laughs> to walk to the grocery store. Uh, it might turn out to the point where you have to at some point. So, uh, But I think that's a good idea. Me out here... I believe I, if I were to take back roads, uh, because I wouldn't, you know, just take one straight shot down the main road to the store, uh, it's probably around 10 miles. So that is a pretty big jaunt for me. But that would actually be pretty cool. It, it would take a few hours. Not like I'd be, um, I don't think I'd be buying any ice cream or anything like that on my my hike to the hike to the grocery store. But it would give you an idea of, it, it would help you with your stamina and it, it would give you an idea of you know what to expect maybe going there wouldn't be too bad because you wouldn't want a fully loaded bug out bag because then you'd have nowhere to put your groceries uh but you could have some stuff in there and then on the way back you would you would feel that weight and i think 10 miles would give me a pretty good idea uh, about how things were going to go now recently i've been doing uh, a mile or two here and there not i was going to do it three times a week and i haven't gotten quite to that point but with my bag on going out and walking the dogs and doing all sorts of things but uh not not that full not that really long trip uh and it's getting into the fall now and i don't know if we're going to get another opportunity to go hiking like we usually do uh so i'm not sure if i'm going to have the opportunity to do that but going to the grocery store you know uh, why not? And depending on where you live, uh, maybe it is only a couple miles and that would be a good walk and it'd be a good opportunity uh, for you to, uh, you know, see what you're in for as far as uh, the bug out bags are concerned. All right. So the last slide I have here, uh, home defense weapons. Uh, and there were a few on this as well that were pretty interesting. Uh, number 70, uh, have self-defense weapons, weapons and objects placed strategically inside of your residence that will allow you to protect uh, your physical integrity uh, if SHTF, guns, knives, hammers, etc. cetera, uh, but not in an obvious position where every burglar will get to them first. Uh, without giving a whole lot away and talking too much on this, there are places in your home, and it really depends on who's in your family. If you've got kids you're going to want to think differently about all of this stuff. But you could go, you could hide pepper spray or something underneath the table. You know, duct tape underneath the coffee table. Um, things all around the house. Think about if somebody were to come into your home through the front door, what your route would be and strategically place some stuff along that route uh, that you could grab as you're running away from that or, or putting yourself in a position uh, to defend yourself. In this article, they talk about safe rooms as well, uh, not necessarily being the bunker, but a place where you can uh, protect yourself for the time being. 
But it's along, along those same lines. Have that stuff strategically placed around your house uh, that you, regardless of what room you're in, when something happens, you've got something there uh, that can help you out. Again, it'd pay it, uh, you know, be careful and leery about who is in your home because if you've got young children, uh, kids and stuff like that, you don't want a whole bunch of weapons um, all over the place in the house because regardless of how good you think you, you hit it, <laughs> kids will probably find it. Uh, kids are, you know, kids are... Kids are just like that. Uh, I, I was anyway. I, I, I'd find anything. You hear stories about it all the time. So if you have children, you may need to think differently about this stuff. But, um, you know, with us being empty nesters now, it's a little bit of a different story. Um, and also with this, uh, th this is where they, I, I did put this in there, the peephole uh, at eye level. Um, I thought I took that out, but evidently I didn't. Um, also on this, though, have something by the front door. Because that is, you know, even if it's just a baseball bat or whatever, have something by the front door. That way it is something if you do open the door and you're not sure who's there and, and it is somebody that you're kind of leery about, it's that something right there that you can grab onto uh, and, you know, just be ready for a situation if it happens. Uh, a lot of the times, you know, you, you could carry the gun on your hip as you're, you're around the house. I do that sometimes. Not every day, though. Not all the time. Uh, but, you know, that, that could be something that is sitting right by your front door as well. Again, uh, the kids aspect of it. Uh, they have different types of, you know, like secret compartments. We talked about this earlier uh, where there's picture frames that you can slide open and it's got a firearm in there. There's shelves that the shelf pops down. I have one of those that the firearm sits inside of it. So you could have that shelf sitting by your front door. Uh, or something like that, something high enough the kids can't get to it. Uh, if you've got teenagers, you need to think about that. Uh, I mean, just, you know, a lot of things you need to think about the kids and the family and, and everybody's safety first before you do all this stuff. Because uh, honestly, we're talking about an SHTF situation here that is far less likely than, uh, you know, just the daily stuff with your teenagers and kids and all that stuff. So just be, I, I guess, just be smart about all this stuff. So. Uh, Brandon said, hey, Alexa, play Welcome to the Jungle. <laughs> uh, one last thing before I get out of here, and I'll try to uh, read everybody. Is if anybody's got any tips you want to add to this, uh, now would be the time. I'll, I'll kind of pay attention to uh, what you guys are putting in there. But one thing I did want to mention, they were talking about communications as well. And when you're in a bug out situation or a get home situation, uh, you want to be, you want to maintain that gray man aspect, but you also want to be incognito. And they talked about having headphones uh, for your transistor radio. I've got these headphones right here that are for a Baofeng radio. Uh, and these ones won't work for a transistor radio because the Baofeng has got this crazy little plug right here with the two prongs on it. Uh, but if you are uh, in a, an SHTF situation, you don't want the music cranking. If Even if you're in home, and other people don't have electricity and all that, you know, you don't want kids blasting the radio. You have the wireless headphones, uh, which would be okay in a bug out situation. I don't see these being any good at all. Uh, I've, I use them every once in a while when I'm on my tractor and you start bouncing around and it falls out of your ear. At least if you've got headphones with the cord on them, it's going to fall out of your ear and it's just going to hang there. These suckers could get lost. In a bug out situation, get home situation, there may be hills, you may be running, you may have to take off real quick and then you lose these. So I would say it's a fantastic idea to get the headphones. Uh, it, and especially since in a situation like that, uh, even if we have the ham radio and and or something like that, we're not necessarily going to be monitor or not um, sending out. We're not going to be talking on it all that much. We're not going to be broadcasting is what I'm trying to say here. We're going to be monitoring it. So you'd want those headphones and something that you can hear that information coming through, but nobody else can. Uh, and I'd say, you know, maybe one headphone in, one headphone out because you want to hear what's going on around you. Uh, as well as hear the stuff on the radio. Maybe you've got the NOAA and the, the alerts and you're trying to get information about a certain situation and all that. But you don't want to give away your situation and, or give away your, yeah, your situation. Uh, this is, I think, especially important at night too. If you have found a spot that you're just going to hunker down, maybe spend the night and then make the, the rest of your trek the next day, um, you know, maybe that's a good idea as well. 
Uh, Brandon said, let me see if I can pull up this comment right here. Uh, they make a cheap throat mic for those radios too. A bit light and they have a thick neck, but they work. Yeah, I, I think it's just a, a really good idea to have that. Just be as incognito as you can. Uh, you don't want to be, you know, hoofing it down the street with your transistor radio uh, blaring and everybody knowing what you're doing. Or if you're in a situation uh, where it is an SHTF event and the electricity is out and people are wondering what's going on, if everything's dead silent and pitch dark, that sound is going to carry a long way. Uh, along with this too, and then I'm going to get out of here tonight, with that whole, if you're at home and it's a SHTF situation and it's, uh, you know, nobody's got electricity, nobody's able to cook or anything like that, you got to think about that as well. The If you go outside and you light up that barbecue, you're basically ring, ringing the dinner bell for the neighbors. So uh, you've got to think about those things as well. We've got a sun oven that is absolutely fantastic for situations like that because you can basically cook anything you want and it doesn't give off smell. Uh, I can put that in the backyard, have it sit out there all day long cooking a pot roast or something, and the dogs don't even mess with it. So you know it's it's not giving off any smell if the dogs aren't messing with it. But you've got the dehydrated foods. You've got all of these different things as, as far as prepper meals that we can do uh, that don't require the grill. Now, in some situations, uh, again, that is the the dire worst you know worst case scenario type thing. In some situations, maybe it wouldn't be, especially early on, if people didn't know exactly how bad things were going to get. And you know, you hear all the time about everybody having picnics and trying to use the food in their refrigerators before it goes bad. I could see that possibly happening. Uh, I don't know that I would be one of those guys donating too much food to that. Uh, but uh, you know what? In the very beginning of something, I'd probably be one of the guys over there eating it. Might as well, right? Uh, then when things got to be a little bit more dire, I'd be definitely be holding my cards close to my vest in a situation like that because you just never know how long something's going to go on. And that's what, what my thought process would be during that is, okay, it's possible that this is over in a week. It's possible maybe two weeks, and we can sort of get through it. But what if it doesn't? And that's where I would be, uh, you know, thinking, of, really thinking hard about all of that stuff is is where we're going to, where is this thing going to go? And if we come out, you know, after a week or so, then great. But if it lasts longer, I'm going to at least be set up to handle that situation. So at any rate, I know this was sort of impromptu tonight. Um, next Wednesday, I'm going to be doing a live stream. I've got the roaming prepper on, and he's a pretty cool, cool dude. He's got uh, his YouTube channel uh, here on YouTube. Uh, if you want to go check him out, the roaming prepper, he does live stream sometimes. We're going to talk about, you know, society. We're going to talk some of, of the, the deeper stuff when it comes to preparedness next week about how, you know, everything's just, it seems like it's just falling apart, um, the morals in this country and all that stuff and um, the different disaster situations that we could possibly see on the horizon. So that'll be a fun show uh, Wednesday night. I'll get that scheduled. And once it's scheduled, you can hit the notification icon and get that. Um, I'm also going to be doing a show here in the near future with, uh, I think his channel is called Mayhem Preparedness. Uh, it's something to that effect, but Darren and I are going to do a show and Darren has been a, a friend of the Survival's Prepper podcast for a long time and a true blue 100% prepper uh, that really has it going on and has a lot of insight into all this stuff. So I want to have him on. He's got his own own YouTube channel as well, but uh, very cool dude and very interesting to talk to. We had a conversation the other day and uh, I, you know, I should have been hit. I should have been recording it. It was such a good conversation. So, uh, but uh, a couple of really good guests coming up here in the future. And then uh, whenever I feel like it, I suppose I'll do the same thing today. If I find a good article, I'll just read through it and um, you just do a live stream. If you guys have any ideas or any thoughts on what would make a good show that you want to hear about, uh, let me know. But uh, with that, uh, I'll go through a couple of the couple of the comments here. Brandon misreading the river. I almost have to ignore those because I never know from one second to the other what they're going to be talking about. So, <laughs> but anyway, guys, I appreciate you being in the chat tonight, White Rabbit. Uh, thank you for joining in, and everybody else that I'm I'm forgetting about here. I saw a few of you tonight, and I, uh, I'm forgetting names and everything. But all of you, I appreciate you joining in. Everyone listening to the podcast, I appreciate that as well. Uh, but with that, take care, everyone. We'll talk.